Chapter 11 Swearing in of the Government The first few weeks of April were eventful days incarceration. Early morning to the court, on the way, Dhaka, my city, done with spring makeover, new foliage, young and shiny, asserting the beginning of life, except for the last touch of the lips of the fiery flaming tree, a bride ready for her day. I waited in the Hajot of the Parliament, famous for Louis Kahn's iconic architecture. This kangaroo court, a blasphemous mockery. The sitting of the court was delayed till 2.30 p.m. Duli passed on a roll and a bottle of water through a guard for my lunch. Poor girl. I caught a glimpse of her on my way to the restroom. I advised her, throwing my words as I walked, to go home for her lunch. Her glistening eyes refused. While going back, I did so again, but she lied, saying that she had had her lunch. This part of the parliament building had been used earlier as MP's hostel and was occasionally rented out for wedding parties. The windows, or more appropriately, the glass doors where the courtroom had been set up were all sealed to preempt any escape by the accused. Sitting idly, I looked out an arch atrociously grilled. One more security measure, a smear on the beauty of the place. At the lake that surrounded the building, massive concrete blocks with the strangest design to let the air and sunshine in, stolen by Khan's brilliance. Beyond the sun, mirrored into the countless stars on the waters, sparkling and dancing on the waves and the spring breeze created in tenderness. On such occasions, my seat was next to Sheikh Hasina's in the dock. Just the two of us. I was aware of the rare privilege and the distance between the daughter of the father of the nation, former prime minister of the country, and the leader of the largest political party, and me, a small individual caught in the storm of time. As the court proceedings commenced, Sheikh Hasina walked in, in a wrinkled overall, straight out of her hospital bed. She told the court how she had been made to discharge despite incomplete treatment her eyes affected by glaucoma, her hearing impaired by an earlier grenade attack on her life. How indecently and inhumanly she had been treated by the jail authority. Her voice cracked occasionally with emotion. Her eyes got moist. I listened and prayed. The defense started in deliberations, passionately seeking the court's interventions to ensure adequate medical care for Sheikh Hasina, pointing to the many instances of neglect she has been subject to in the custody of the jail authority, including the dubious ways in which she had been discharged from the hospital. The assertion of the prosecution that she had been released on request raised further questions. Whose request? Who was the authority that was pulling all the strings yet remained out of sight? All these lent a shady and conspiratorial spin to the unanswered questions. 
Sheikh Hasina even stood up to ask where else she could seek redress other than this court. The judge was cold, callous, and unconcerned, eager to start the regular proceedings of the case, which he soon did. While discussing her health issues, I casually mentioned that I had been waiting for the court proceedings to get underway since the morning. Her next question was, Did you have anything for lunch? How concerned and sensitive she was about the others, even in the face of the most trying moments. She could easily flip to reality and embrace objective conditions with ease. On hearing that I was having an initial phase of cataract, she quipped, Aren't we all getting old? Even earlier, once in a while, in the dock, Sheikh Hasina had mentioned her variety of ailment, hypertension, erratic blood pressure, onset of glaucoma, problems with hearing aid, one of the lingering reminders of the many attempts on her life, I listened with helpless concern and sadness, modestly suggesting that her health should get the first priority and everything else could wait. I could not imagine the future of Bangladesh's politics without her. As we were waiting to finish the discussion with the lawyer, a young man in his 20s, sporting a collarless t-shirt, jeans and a cap, clapped his hand and addressing Sheikh Hasina shouted aloud, as if giving marching orders, Let's move! Enraged, I was about to turn back and ask who the hell he was and what business he had in the courtroom. Duli, sensing my move, pulled me away to avoid any encounter with these shadowy characters. The scene dodged me. From where did the young man, obviously an intelligence underling, get this audacity? Gone were our legacies of centuries of courtesy, respect for elders, and for women in particular. Back in the cell, I was consoled by the two plumeria trees with which I had forged a bond, the twins like buried giants, stretched out their bare branches to the heavens all winter, folded hands in prayer, asking for deliverance for the spell which had stripped them naked of all signs of life. All that changed with a touch of spring. Countless small flowers, white, with a dash of yellow in the center, shaped like hearts, burst forth, showering them with kisses of love and asserting the victory of forbearance. A collage of still life in abstract, thousands of flowers, starry looking, naughty smiles in the tips of the branches. Each bunch held by a bouquet of sprouting green leaves, paying homage to God for having listened and given life one more chance, a triumph of beauty over the beast. Old friends, General Wahab, Qureshi, a retired CEO from a bank, and Dr. Sadiq Bhuya came to see me. Real surprise, the affection of people were more enduring than the pains confinement could clamp on an individual. Rumors were in the air that General Moin, chief of staff of the army, who was calling all the shots in the caretaker government as the front office, was working on a plan to install himself as the president of Bangladesh. Many of my fellow's inmates thought that his trip to India was to sell his proposition and win Dilli's support in exchange for promises to deliver on India's request. I laughed it away since I was sure 
that India would not settle its strategic issues with Bangladesh through dealing with a military government. Deb Mukherjee, former Indian High Commissioner to Bangladesh, when asked by the media, once commented that India could settle her outstanding issues with Bangladesh only with a democratically elected government. He would go on to add that such an agreement should also be perceived by the general public as being of benefit to them. Interestingly, General Moin was presented by his Indian counterpart with a thoroughbred horses. His short stature good enough to slip under their belly. Ah, if wishes were horses. We have been reading in the newspaper allowed in the jail about a gathering of storms outside hungry millions, the poor, mostly women and children, in long queues at the fair price shops opened by the government. A shame for a country that prided on its self-sufficiency in cereal production not so long ago. Bangladesh, and for that matter, any country was not cut out to be run by international staff, NGOs and other psychophants with unseen power backstopping them. The mess they were creating and more crucially, the miseries they were causing would be their Achilles heel, even as pot-bellied academics would be scratching their heads arguing whether to term the situation as famine or hidden hunger. Peppered misery their intellectual appetizer. What a mess made of a country that only the other day held promise of joining the ranks of middle-income nations. An ill-designed, more appropriately, ill-intended campaign against corruption has degenerated into most corrupt practices. Lawyers were being bought by the Anti-Corruption Commission to deny the accused access of legal assistance and services. Cases were being framed against the intended victims with witness intimidated to give scripted evidence. Courts were being dictated not only in passing judgment but also in their daily proceedings. While the institutions of governance were predators, havens, during the period of previous rule, the caretaker government was laying into ruins not only the formal institutions but also our age-old social capital. The demons were coming out in their true selves, shedding their angelic makeovers. What could be the likely response from a government that had taken over ostensibly to conduct free and fair election, but had gradually mutated back into a genetic original? An unelected, military-backed government settling in for a long haul. But then, faced with the challenges of government and more importantly failures, would they dig in out of fear in more autocratic ways and to create the grounds for dangerous confrontations? I tried to assess the future. Power corrupts, but unbounded power, as this government was exercising under the grab of emergency rule, would lead to a rot. I envisioned the emerging signs. Prices were soaring. People were forming beelines for rights. Students had vowed to resist Fokhruddin's visit to Dhaka University to inaugurate a building constructed two years back. Demands for the release of Sheikh Hasina were gathering support. The BNP had called upon its followers to prepare for a movement. The groundswell of resentment and despair could erupt in an unanticipated ways. While the storm was gathering strength, my faith in eventual deliverance got stronger. 
like the Plumeria twins. I was at peace with myself, taking a philosophical, a spiritual stance at the airing of time. Maktub, destiny, thou art unfathomable. Another court appearance while the defense arguments on the discharged petition of Sheikh Hasina were being presented, we talked about the varied subjects. Books Sheikh Hasina had in her hand Khaled Husseini's A Thousand Splendid Sons. I had read a rave review about it, I said. She was looking forward to reading it. I have two books. Oronok and Fifth Mountain with me. This could have been my third reading of Oronok by Bibhuti Bhushan, one of my favorites, a tale woven around a pristine beauty of forest, mutely humming in the hushed voice, transforming itself during the day and the night, and the change of seasons in magical beauty. Its denizens in blissful embrace with a life that offered so little, yet so fulfilling. A Calcutta-born urban heart is first disoriented by the crushing loneliness of the forest, then falls in love with its hidden mystical world and becomes part of it. Sheikh Hasina, a student of literature, knew it all too well and nodded in agreement. Her health? I was concerned, and in the past I suggested that she avail the first opportunity to take care, everything else could wait. Dreamers were circulating that she might go abroad for treatment. I prayed silently. Politics. My precinct assessment seemed to surface. There were whispers about General Muin's ambitions of becoming president of the country when he granted himself extension for a year in military service. I doubted any feasible path for him towards the goal in a democratic process short of promulgating military rule which, given the current condition of the country, appeared far-fetched and a gamble he could dare not take. Sheikh Hasina nodded. But she was concerned about the fractures among the top echelon of her party. The government had been trying to rope in the leaders of the major parties, promising them important roles in the future, including the office of the Prime Minister. A new demand for political reform, orchestrated and promoted by them, was being discussed to end what they labeled as the dynastic rule the old stance of minus two. New political platforms were being touted with discarded politicians joined by the active ones. Many of the top leaders of the both leading parties, Aumi League and BNP, were being increasingly bought over in the unfurling political game. Sheikh Hasina was hurt by the waning of the bonds that held her party together, in particular those who were tied like a family during the years of her political saga. I was at loss as how such veteran politicians could be duped so easily. Sheikh Hasina did not have the answer either but speculated that some people succumb to threats and blackmail, common techniques employed by the military governments, more easily than others. Many of our top leaders were old and might have lost their stomach to revisit prison, and if allegiance was sweetened by offers of position and privilege, not many would decline. The people in power had sent feelers to Sheikh Hasina too with the offer of a respectable retirement from politics. The message had clearly been delivered at a wrong address. 
But Sheikh Hasina, an incorrigible optimist, pinned her hopes on support of the grassroots workers of Aumi League in the face of the dithering central leadership. The challenge before her was to consolidate the ground-level loyalty into a potent force that could put pressure on the regime, staying within the bounds of the present law and more importantly, while she was incarcerated. I had no clue as how this would be pulled through except for my faith in Sheikh Hasina, a leader of the common people. Duli and my lawyer had some unfriendly arguments about pending fees. Later, I came to learn that one had to pay in advance to lawyers for their services. But I had no such means and hoped for gratis service for nominal fees. Not knowing how long this ordeal would continue, I couldn't throw away my modest savings for legal services and leave my family broke. I even thought of doing without a lawyer and doing it myself. Given that these were sham trials and the outcome had already been decided, unless events forced them the other way. But then I remembered the God-sent generosity and help from an avuncular friend, Barrister Rofikul Hawk, one of the most expensive lawyers in town, who only practiced in the Supreme Court. Asma, Duli and Fahmi had been bothering him with my case for bail in the highest court, as also many others, for he alone refused to sign up for the Anti-Corruption Commission as their lawyer. Receiving my family with his mysterious signature smile, cautioning them of the legal hazards that stood in the way, he worked out his strategy silently to get me out on bail. Each time he succeeded. He was backstopped by a young, handsome barrister, Taposh, who could have easily made a career in movies had he wished. Neither Rafiq Bhai nor Taposh charged a dime for their services. No van to take me to jail right then. I ate whatever Duli had left for me and lay down on the Hajat floor. Obaidul Kader, the ex-minister from the Army League, wanted to know Sheikh Hasina's overall stance since I had the unique privilege of having access to her. Given my non-political background, I avoided any discussion, lest I make an inappropriate observation. Half in zest, he said, You are lucky to be a co-accused with Sheikh Hasina. I loathe being held on petty charges. Without commenting, I returned a smile. I was greeted outside on the way back by a city bathed in turmeric glow. Known in rural Bangladesh as bridal sunshine, I felt sad to stand up in the van and steal a look of my young days, almost half a century back, on such spring afternoons around the university campus, along the footpaths, past the art college, towards Shakura restaurant. Let tears not dampen the freshness nor tamper the vitality of the treasures of the past. Let this be another day in the journey of life, though in the afternoon having traversed many thorny paths, yet surviving, breathing, smelling, hearing the world around with nostalgia, no less a treasure for a traveler's gone weary. If this was my story of life, be it. Good news at Rupsha. The bakery next door will serve vegetables and beef, of course, with payment. A convict has been found, one from London. 
serving a 20-year term, reportedly a Queen's awardee, as chef for his Borishal veg and Bengal beef to supervise the kitchen. Also, biryani was to be on the menu the next Friday. Next day, we were to appear in court. On my way to the gate, I met a young man I had noticed before, floating around as if he owned the place. His long hair dropping to his shoulder, his first crop of unshaven beard, sharp features and pair of dreamy eyes intrigued me, made him look otherworldly. Walking beside me, he asked who I was. I gave him a quick snapshot of my background. Continuing, he wanted to know what had brought me here, to which I was equally brief. He said he had been watching me walking up to the gate every so often and felt sorry for me. With an air of confidence, he assured me, like a young man comforting his ailing father, that help was around. He seemed to have dropped from nowhere to make me feel happy. It didn't occur to me to ask about his prison term, nor the reasons. In a convict's white uniform with blue stripes, he seemed at peace with himself, as if on self-imposed hermit's life, a serene purity gliding past the milieu with the smile of a patron saint. When I reached the gate, he had all but disappeared. But the affection and sympathy of a stranger, and that too from a young man, who would normally not take notice of people like us, touched me and lingered on. Sheikh Hasina had her back paper napkins doused in freshener. Graciously, she handed one to me. In that hot, humid, and claustrophobic room, this was a pleasant relief and a touch of the world outside that offered many such goodies. I had carried cloves and cardamoms in my pocket to chew, a tradition handed down, and offered a few to Sheikh Hasina. She took them with an appreciative smile. On the next occasion, on my way to jail gate, I saw a crowd milling around the bakery, a touch of reality as people came and bought cakes, hot dogs, cookies, etc. A shopping scene bringing one of the primordial social legacies of mankind next to Rupsha, the bakery standing as the lone endearing icon of life, otherwise so harsh in confinement. I met a middle-aged lady, politician's wife, in the prison van, being taken to court. She looked shattered, lost, and in tears as I tried to console her. She looked up at me with an emptiness in her eyes that pierced my heart. Life seemed to have been irrevocably stolen from her. It was an important day in the courtroom. I listened to the deliberation of historic case. Sitting next to Sheikh Hasina, a defining time of our history and also of the judiciary. Many landmark issues were discussed. Two brilliant lawyers, Barrister Shafiq and Barrister Taufik, enlarged the canvas by bringing in benchmark judgment as they dwelt wider and deeper beyond the mundane and the factual issues. Intermittently, their arguments came back to establish the charges as false, baseless, and triumphed us against the former Prime Minister to harm her political career. It was also the day scheduled for the hearing of my bail petition in the Appellate Division. Duli was not there from the start. Then she came from a distant smile and nodded from side to side, her lips moving to say, it's done. The bail, which had been declined by the High Court Division, was granted by the Appellate Division. I closed my eyes in prayer and thanked Allah at the most unlikely outcome. Sheikh Hasina was happy to learn the news, first instance of finding a pathway, though the labyrinth of murky judicial system 
confounded further by emergency laws. She added, mockingly though, that everybody could be set free except she. A police officer reverentially whispered to me while controlling the crowd of lawyers inside the courtroom, more like a secret agent passing on bits of information, that his father had been a police officer who fought under me during our liberation war. To me, he was trying to unburden himself of his guilt of being on the prosecutor's side. A strange feeling struck me of being a hero and a villain in the same breath in this fictional trial. Fahmi joined during the recess after attending the proceeding at the appellate division a short while earlier. He told me the story of how it had all gone in court. Maktoub. Strange were the ways of the Almighty. He confirmed that once the papers were ready, a matter of time only, I should be out of the prison, nothing could stand in the way. In the court, Hajot waiting to be taken to jail, I shared the news of my bail with others assembled there, a bit hesitantly though, since they too were praying for similar deliverance. While in the van, I looked around and told myself that it was to join the crowd outside in the scorching sun, to walk these footpaths along the others, to hail a cab or a rickshaw, to get lost in all the alleys, to be free and even faceless, but part of humanity, and that I had pined for so intently. It was to conquer these denials that our souls craved so much. And in the end, to go back to our known world and its embrace, however bitter it may be at times. Office Call Asma, Duli, Mridula and Pahmi came. This time with a sense of reunion in the offing. Modud Pai was there too, meeting with his relatives. His family had been abroad since he had been taken in. He was most generous in wishing me early release and felt genuinely happy, though it was nearly a year that he had spent within these walls. Everyone was in a happy mood, except for any untoward twist of events keeping me in jail. I prayed that would not happen. A few things were brought for me from home, not following the list that I usually gave the preceding week, since I would be out the next day of office call, relieved that this routine was coming to an end. Later, Wahab and Kashim Shahib, a golfing buddy, came to see me. Wahab, being a retired general, managed a special dispensation for an extra visit. Kashim Shaheb had a quick trip down memory lane. He stayed in the jailer's residence as a young boy in 1947 when his father moved to join as the first jailer after the partition of India. He was then seven years old. On my way back from office call, I looked at the large crowd in front of Jomuna and Meghna some having community bath and felt a strange oneness with them, a bond that had unwittingly grown out of shared misery. This motley crowd of unknown faces looked dear to me. Destiny had tied us together in this world of denial. I was one of them. April 14th Bangla New Year and a Holiday we woke up to loud music and discovered a large stage set up at Jomuna Yard with a colorful shamiana over it and rows of chairs neatly laid out in rows in front. We could hear songs, I was told by invited artists from outside, accompanied by a band, lending a festive ambience alien to this world. The jail authority served special breakfast Pantabhat and Ilish, inheritance of our culture, a change of heart at least for a day. In our cell, we sat together in a semicircle on cots and a few on chair. 
for our way to celebrate. To me, our tradition made more sense to ring in the new year as dawn ushered in the day with its appearance, rather than a clock striking the first moment, a very mechanical way to welcome an occasion of joy, devoid of emotion and surely a practice that had come from westernization, increasingly commercialized. Poem written in custody were recited while a few among us volunteered to sing. A surreal world, songs of love and loss, land and seasons and outside, Kat Kolap, also known as Plumeria, having defeated its seasonal aging, was now adorned with flowers and leaves, crows hopping along its branches, collecting twigs for their nests. Further away, the red walls of the building that were visible through our windows formed the background, as if a canvas, for the light and shade to draw changing pattern while a luminous sunshine bathed the world with a tender touch. A forbidden scene created defying the laws of tyranny, asserting life against denials. With moist eyes and detachment, I listened, going back in time as the songs brought back memories, distant, vague, and incandescent. The short trip in time didn't last long. The next appearance in court was on 17th April, a day that brought back torrent of memories. Those could wait for a revisit later. I had come to court with the hope of walking to freedom right away or later in the day from the jail. The lawyer appointed by me asked the judge for my release from the production warrant. The order by which the judge asked jail authority to reduce an accused who is held under their custody in a case other than the one in his court. Since I had been granted bail in the other case, and also the one in his court, by the highest court of the country. The public prosecutor raised a mild objection, saying that he needed some time before the question could be settled. The judge declined saying that he had no jurisdiction to keep me in the custody of jail authority. It was understood that the order for my release would be passed before the court retired. I saw the intelligent operative known to all for his unflinching presence in the courtroom and civilian clothes. Call out the PP. They were gone for a good 15 minutes. I told Sheikh Hasina of a plot being hatched by the two. Why else would they disappear together given their reputation for conspirational scheming? A short argument followed between the prosecution and the defense about the absence of the press people, presumably as a protest by them for one of their colleagues, a young press woman, having been asked to vacate her chair so that a policeman could be seated. Incidentally, the courtroom was always full and to be able to sit through hours of proceedings was a privilege worth fighting for. After the court hour, I told Duli about the intelligence guy and the PP going out in the courtroom together and my apprehension about a conspiracy in making, although I couldn't imagine one. She reaffirmed, saying that while she was coming to the court, a policeman had quietly passed on the news that something nasty was being planned and she should take note. Duli, through her media contacts, had tried to verify and was comforted to the contrary. The release from the production warrant was such a routine matter that it should have been done in minutes in court. But then she would stay back, collect the papers and be at the jail gate in a matter of hours at best. I should be heading home inshallah by evening. Fahmi by then had gone over to the judge's chamber and Duli quickly took leave of me to join him while I boarded the prison van for the jail.
April 1971. Time was running out for our government to be announced. The world to know that we were not a bunch of adventurers, but standard bearer of a relentless political movement for independence which had to abandon the peaceful path in the face of a brutal crackdown by the army. We met Ta- we met Tajuddin Ahmed and Amirul Islam at the Indian BOP of Tungi. Briefed them about the fast changing events and the rapid closing window of opportunity to have the government announce on our own soil with stoic confidence. Tajuddin reassured us that it was in the offing. The Pak army went full steam in their counterattacks during the second week of April. Pakistan Air Force (PAF) started a series of bombing runs over Kamarkhali, Kushtia, and Chuadanga to clear us of these places and take control. Freedom fighters put up fierce resistance at Bishoykhali, inflicting heavy losses to the enemy who had launched the attack under cover of delivery of heavy artillery with reinforcement from Dhaka to forestall any surprises like Kushtia. Pak paratroopers landed behind our position of a small contingent at Gualondo before launching a combined attack. The consequence was foregone. In a similar manner, we lost control of the Harding Bridge, a mission reportedly to have been personally supervised by General Mitha Khan of Pak Army. While our extended positions were overrun by the coordinated attacks from the enemy, devoid of any reliable communication among us, we became desperate group, each fending for oneself. One could not defend oneself against a professional army, lest of all defeated when splintered attacking any communication along the advance position or with the rear. We started retreating haphazardly without any hope of regrouping. Isolated from one another, this dealt a heavy blow to our morale. On top of it, rations were in short supply. Lack of medical care meant the wounded were to depend on ad hoc medication. Some dying for lack of it. We had no plans for standing up against the enemy. The Pak army was regaining control of Kushtia, Chuadanga, and closing in on Meherpur. They took innocent civilians for questioning, many of whom never returned. Houses were indiscriminately burned down to avenge their earlier defeats, as well as to intimidate population through showcasing the severe consequencing of harboring any plan to resist their occupation. The tables had turned. To retreat to Meherpur was short-lived as the enemy kept pressing under the cover of PAF, followed by artillery attacks. Our men started packing again in great hurry to leave for India. Moral dipped low and we were at loss of what to do next. In the back of our mind, we had tossed over the idea of refuge in India till our final victory, knowing that the first round of fights against the enemy might not go our way for long. As the last resort, were we to cross over to India, we had to decide to take along with us whatever cash we could lay our hands on. Mine was specially privileged position with the treasury under my custody. As we started retreating towards Meherpur, Wali and Kamal, SDOs of Magura and Norail respectively, also decided to move northwest and cross over to India through Meherpur. They brought along some cash in trunks and left them in my custody. When we finally decided to abandon Meherpur for India, I had the treasury opened and loaded 
the cash of high denomination into trunks, three of them, leaving the notes of low denomination, one rupee, unsecured, which were merely taken by all and sundry. The vault of local banks were also emptied of all their contents. Taking the trucks across was a formidable challenge. Loaded with cash, the trucks covered some distance along the road till it came to an abrupt end. A curious crowd of villagers gathered around the vehicle in no time, not knowing what the trucks carried. The Pakistan Air Force by then had started pounding the road to Meherpur in preparation for the final assault. At the back of our mind was the apprehension of being identified from the sky, so drawing their wrath. We had to hurry up. Soon, a convention of sorts of onlookers was in place trying to figure out solutions for taking the trucks across the India. Finally, ropes were gathered, trucks were tied and literally dragged across the farmlands like sledges on ice by scores of people volunteering for once in a lifetime experience. After the arduous experimentations, we made it to no man's land. Our lender of last resort was safe. Mahbub and I were trying to bring order in our retreats from Chuadanga to Meherpur and then across to India. Although we couldn't do much in the chaotic situation, no one was in a mood to listen. Thousands of freedom fighters, supporters and ordinary citizens streamed towards India for safety and security. It was our turn to make the final move. Abandoning Meherpur was a painful experience. The enemy was getting close and we had no hope of retaining control over Bangladesh. Meherpur was our last strand which has served as the rear headquarters for over a week. It was past evening when Mahbub and I drove to Meherpur, having abandoned our positions, no lights, not a soul around. Even the stray dogs seemed to have vanished in thin air. The headlights of our jeep pierced through the darkness of dead township, which was teeming with retreating forces hours back. The same magic wand that had roused the town from a slumber to euphoria seemed to have waved it back to the abyss of despair. As we were passing the fork, the street on the left leading to my bungalow, I paused for a second and thought of packing some of my belongings before I went away for good. But that looked like stealing from one's own home. And I decided otherwise and headed west across to India, abandoning her in the safety of darkness, hoping the sun would never rise to welcome the enemy troops. I wanted my first workplace, love, to be tucked away, unblemished in my memory. In 1946, another young man of my age, my borrow mama, paternal uncle, Noor, was witnessing a less talked about historic event in the Indian independence movement, the high drama the British termed as the Bombay Mutiny. Dashingly handsome, Mama looked a picture-perfect naval man who could well advertise for the profession. Just above a year in his service, he was posted in HMIS Talwar in its shore communication installation. February 1946 saw a gathering of discontents among the sailors in the Royal Indian Navy at the racist and discriminatory treatment meted out by their British superiors, particularly evident in the poor food served to the natives. A group of new recruits who had just arrived at Castle Barracks refused to take the meal and decided to go to the city instead, a breach of naval discipline. 
Mama recalled the final exchange among the British and the Indians. We can't take this meal. It's not worth animal feed. Oh, you want better food? When did Indians become so choosy? Retorted a British staff. We were walking away. We shall have our food in some restaurants in the city. Beggars can't be choosers, shouted the Brit. This last moment was enough to light the tinderbox. Words spread like wildfire. All the Indian sailors of Royal Indian Navy on board ship and shore establishment in Bombay went on strike. In a show of defiance reminiscent of Sepoy Mutiny in 1857, they lowered the Union Jack and raised three flags tied together that one of the Congress, the Muslim League and the Communist Party. A show of unity breached all the divides the British had nurtured for years. From this initial flashpoint in Bombay, the mutiny found instant support throughout the naval establishment in India from Karachi to Calcutta. Mama remembered having joined the groups of sailors parading through the streets of Bombay in open lorries in a show of defiance, shouting Jai Hind to the hails of his citizens, who later called a total shutdown of the city. Except for some exchange of fire at Castle Barracks, with some casualties on both sides, a tense standoff continued. While guns were honed on the rebel position and the squadrons of Royal Air Force flew low over them, the British cashed on the political endgame. For India, they had been working with Congress and the ML. They played on the fears of the Indian politicians that armed movement may quickly get out of control and leadership further evidenced by the loyalty these sailors showed for Netaji, whose stories from Burma had been their source of inspiration. The British knew the risks of this empire if the mutiny continued and gained strength and support. The fate of the last Mughal emperor Bahadur Shah Zafar and the near decapitation of the East India Company, had some strategy been executed by the rebels, were stark reminders of potential risks to both Indian politicians and the British authority. In no time, Mamak recalled, Balla Bhai Patel came to negotiate with the rebel, signaling lack of political support for the sailors. Jinnah made a similar statement from Calcutta. The last armed flicker that could have been devoured the Raj and driven the colonial power from India was doused within day. Surrender was brokered, contrary to what had been promised. All the sailors, including Mama, were court-martialed, dismissed from the service and sent home never to be called to service again, either in India nor the Pakistan Navy that came into existence the following year. A thousand miles away from Bombay and two and a half decades later, we were haunted by the footsteps of the history. In a matter of 10 days, we had liberated a third of Bangladesh. To the west of Podda and the Ganges took over the administration of this territory ran the railway from Gualondo to Pakshi, established telephone connection with Calcutta, and were planning to assault the last Pakistani stronghold in Jeshore. And then came a quick reversal of fortune. We were retreating in haste and in disorganized fashion. Our morale was down and weakening, and we had no formally recognized government to support us. Barring a miracle, such an intervention by the Indian military, we were doomed to lose, as we still believed in the first round. There were, however, two strong reasons for our optimism. The overwhelming support of the people and the hatred and animosity towards the Pak army. 
these two could galvanize us into rising from the ashes. Good news in this uncertain time, we were informed that a place had been identified inside Bangladesh at Poitonat Tala, some 10 miles away from Meherpur, suitable for the swearing-in ceremony of the Government of Independent Bangladesh. In April 16th, Mahbub and I went to inspect the site. Canopies of mango grooves joined together spreading over a wide expanse, defined a sleepy village next to the border outpost. Besides the natural camouflage they offered, the location had other reasons for being chosen. Easy to reach from the Indian side by a dirt road that connected the BOP, hidden from the sky from any air attack, had the PAF come to know, any unlikely air raid would involve crossing Indian airspace, a risky choice for the PAF, Herringbond Road from Meherpur, in disrepair, was not usable for any army envoy. Time was the essence, and the job had to be done fast and with utmost secrecy. We had a few answers and mujahids assigned to the BOP, symbolic assertion of our international boundary, the EPR having been moved to Chuadanga under the order of Major Osman. After a brief survey, arrangements were made for a modest stage to be up for the ceremony and borrowing furniture from the Italian missionary at Bhaberpara nearby. A small group was selected to sing the national anthem Captain Mohapatro of BSF made arrangements of chairs for the invitees. Early in the morning of 17 April, we reached Boidunatala. Only having eaten the night before, we asked the men at the BOP whether any food was available. We have prepared dal bhat for ourselves. You're welcome to share, sir. Without much ado, we lunched for the meal, hot and delicious. Are all the arrangements done? I asked. The men had been working all day. The Indians came to survey and left some furniture. One of them replied and then asked in a low voice. What are these arrangements for? We have heard whispers. Though we had kept the exact nature of the function secret, it was time to share with them. Our government is going to be sworn in here today. A lot of important persons will turn up. You are lucky to be part of this historic occasion. I patted one on the back. Let's get going. We made a last minute inspection of all arrangements the dais, the flag to be hoisted, the group to sing the national anthem, chairs on and off the podium. An Indian army contingent had already arrived and taken position, hidden from sight, to secure the place from any enemy advance by land. The stage was all set, a hastily push-up, makeshift home to welcome a newborn. The lack of any elaborate trappings was more than that made up by the love and the longings of an anxious nation to be blessed with an identity, a name and recognition amidst time of uncertainties and shifting fortunes. April, shower of the night before, had bathed a canopy of mango trees with a serene affection. Preparing to embrace the occasion, the sun shone through the branches mischievously, prying like uninvited guests. The leaves too joined, fluttering the subtle rhymes by the soft leftover touch of spring breeze. As time passed, curious people from the nearby villages started gathering. Not fully sure of what was to unfold, Hundreds climbed up 
to sit on the branches of sprawling mango trees, for getting a clear view, not to miss any moment, of a drama never dreamt of being unraveled in their own backyard. Major Osman was to lead the group to present the guard of honor for the president. With no sign of him, I was concerned. My experience in civil administration told me to have an option for any eventuality. I asked Mahbub. What would we do in case Major Osman does not turn up in time? He mulled for a while and replied. If you want, I can make up a snap preparation with the people guarding the BOP. I have been trained in the police academy and these people too have been taught how to present a guard of honor. Although not having practiced for long, the skill may be rusted. Go ahead, I replied. Without any loss of time, Mahbub went to one side and started the rehearsal. I could hear the loud orders to the small group in dirty uniforms, not all to their sizes, wearing faded brown cat shoes. An apology for footwear, fired by zeal about the auspicious duty, they were giving their best. Around 10 in the morning, we heard the sound of the vehicles and knew the function was on. As I stood to receive the honored guests, the convoy of cars, maybe 15 numbers, came to halt at the base of the stage. Syed Nozrul Islam, Tajuddin Ahmed, and the others came out. Tajuddin, visibly appreciative of me, shot a smile and asked, Everything in order? Yes, sir, was my prompt reply, hiding the uncertainty around the guard of honor. The VIPs mounted the dais, took their seats, thronged by the scores of media people, print and electronic, following recitation from the Holy Book, Professor Yusuf Ali began reading out Proclamation of Independence. The crowd fell silent. He was quickly done with it, and I stood dazed, aware of being witnessed to a momentous occasion. Bongo Bondhu Sheikh Mujibur Rahman was declared president of the newly born republic. The oath of office was administered to Syed Nozrul Islam as vice president. Tajuddin Ahmed was sworn in as the prime minister, as also other ministers. The crowd burst into cheers and applause, raising full-throated slogan of Joy Bangla, As if everything was going by the book, Mahbub came forward to take the permission of Syed Nusrul Islam, acting president in the absence of the president, to present the guard of honor. Major Osman had not yet been able to make it. The acting president, with Colonel M. A. G. Osmani, newly appointed commander-in-chief of Bangladesh Defense Forces, standing beside him, took the salute at a smart presentation, which was followed by the inspection of the guard. The national flag was hoisted and a small group sang the national anthem. A scene from the pages of history was being played out in real life in a remote village. The acting president spoke, followed by the Prime Minister. They went through a narration of our democratic struggle spanning over a decade, which had now teamed into the liberation war in the face of Pakistani regime. Waging armed aggression and genocide on the unarmed people of Bangladesh. I introduced the selected guests mostly civilian and army officers sitting on the podium to the acting president and the prime minister. There were many of them present at the occasion from Meherpur, Kushtia, Chuadanga and from far as Pabna, Magura and other neighboring districts. Aware of and overwhelmed by the significance of the passing moment, I lapsed into thoughts. 
a vision of history coming full circle. Bengal had lost its independence at the Battle of Polashi, some 40 miles away from here, in 1757. The British East India Company, employing treachery, bribery and deceit, managed to get a few of the top generals like Mirzafur, the eponymous traitor, to defect the army of, of Noab Shirajuddola, the independent ruler of Bengal, and join Colonel Robert Clive leading the company force against the Nawab. It was the decisive battle that eventually gave the British full control of India, their jewel in the crown, and also the much touted glory of the British Raj. While England flourished at the expense of its empire, what was hailed as the Industrial Revolution, its colonies entered the dark era of exploitation. Had it not been for this battle, the Raj would never been born, and the story of the world and also of the Western civilization would have been scripted differently. The British policy of dividing territories into new nations and states suiting their machination, leaving festering wounds, planting new designation and enmities, apples of discord of any imaginable type, turned into an unenviable legacy as it was forced to vacate the empire. With the government of the People's Republic of Bangladesh sworn in, the lingering ghost of the British in the guise of a country called Pakistan was buried under its laurel. Laurel of corpses, innocent children, men and women dispatched to Dante's Inferno for the final reckoning. History was set right long though it might have taken, and one of the darkest chapters of the British rule in India drew to a close, not far from where the journey started at Polashi. This was also a unique moment. From other perspective, the territory of Bangladesh was united under one government for the first time in recorded history. My rumination were broken as the dignitaries got ready to leave. Prime Minister Tajuddin Ahmed came forward to compliment me. I congratulated him and thanked him for giving the opportunity to be a witness to history. Though reticent, he was kind to add, Not at all. You are not a witness but a part of history, Taufik. What more could a young man, 26 year old, want in life? The mango grove christened as Mujib Nagar, with a place in history, lapsed into its usual anonymity. It was time for us to get back to reality. Divers group bearing arms in foreign territory, driven out of their own country after an unarmed struggle which saw its apogee as also their nadir. With the war in limbo, famished and sheltered under the open sky, our fate hung in the balance. I waited anxiously in my cell, though quasi with an uncanny apprehension, for the moment to arrive, to reunite with freedom and the known world of my family and friends, although a sense of remorse and guilt tinged my feelings, walking away, leaving others to their uncertain fate. From those with whom I had almost made a family and the place my home. Bending over the rail of the veranda, I spent the afternoon hours looking out for the sight of the messenger to come usually a chit in hand, announcing my release. Others joined me in silent prayers. 
Time is a merciless traveler. The sun took its usual leave and the guards came to lock us in. I requested the guards to keep the door that led to the veranda open. They complied, thinking that I would be out of this place the next morning. In the evening, I sat there reflecting over my days of incarceration and freedom that awaited me. Zafar pulled up a chair next to me and spoke in a harsh voice as if he did not wish to disturb me. Sir, you will be going out tomorrow. Today is 17th April. Tell me the events of this day in 1971. I felt good at the inquisitiveness of this young man, born after the liberation of Bangladesh, going quickly through fast-moving drama of April 1971. I narrated the events of the fateful day of 17th April. It was a quite a responsibility on your shoulder, remarked Zafar. After so many years, Zafar, I can see with more clarity the immense significance of the day as well as the proclamation. Are you in a mood to listen? The two-page proclamation of independence of Bangladesh, dated 10th April 1971 and was read out on 17th April 1971 had four basic themes, although not spelled out as such in the document. I stopped to see how Zafar wanted to hear. To my surprise, he was keen to go through the whole episode in details and asked, Sir, what are those themes? First, the circumstances that led up to the proclamation. There were to my mind, nine of them. Sequentially, four critical events were stated that frame the background of why. The election for framing the Constitution of Pakistan was held between December 1970 and January 1971. The people of Bangladesh elected 167 out of 169 representatives from Aumi League Party. General Yahya Khan had summoned the elected representative on 3rd March 1971. The summoned assembly was arbitrarily postponed for an indefinite period. Given this background, the Pakistan authorities instead launched an unjust and treacherous war. Against this backdrop, Bangabundu Sheikh Mujibur Rahman, the undisputed leader of the 75 million people of Bangladesh, duly made a declaration of independence at Dhaka on 26 March 1971 in fulfillment of legitimate right of self-determination and urged the people of Bangladesh to defend the honor and integrity of Bangladesh. The Pakistan authorities, in their conduct, of the ruthless and savage war committed and are still committing genocide and unprecedented repression. These were the three subsequent facts on ground. Finally, the two reasons why we went for the proclamation. The Pakistan authorities made it impossible for the elected representative of the people of Bangladesh to meet and frame a constitution and to give themselves a government. The people of Bangladesh, by their heroism, bravery, and revolutionary fervor, have established control over the territories of Bangladesh. I took a pause and added, I guess I have made those nine points. Fearing that my professional deliberation might have put him off, I looked at Zafar to fathom his reaction. To my surprise, Zafar said, Sir, I have been a student of history and would be interested to hear more from you. I wish our history books looked into these factors in greater detail, but then in 1971, everyone knew of them. Not everyone. This proclamation was addressed equally to the global audience. 
Not all of them had a clear understanding of our liberation war. We were